everyone, Adam Kanakin here at the 2022 ILEADA Conference. With me, back again, Chip Huth. Thanks for joining me, brother. Glad to be here, Adam. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You're back. You're teaching again this year. What are we teaching this year? Uh, you know, uh, the class was so well attended last year that I went ahead and taught the same thing that I taught last year, uh, seven traits of effective leaders, and uh, it's well attended again. So I guess if they keep coming, I'll probably <laughs> keep sharing that information. It, I modified it a little bit because there isn't really a tight script, but um, but it's built around the framework of the seven traits. And, uh, yeah, we had, a, we had a great time. We really enjoyed it. So last year you and I sat down and we, we went through those seven principles. Yep. And so anybody who's wondering about that, you can go back and check out that. We'll link it to this, this episode. But I want to go maybe a deep dive. I want to peel a layer back into that and talk about what is some of the things that gets brought up in class? Because leadership is one of those concepts that everybody talks about leadership, but it's kind of, everybody has their own opinions on it. Sure. Yeah. So when, when you're doing this class, especially at a place like Ailita, where you have all of these instructors, all of this experience, what are some of the concepts that you think or misconceptions that people have about leadership that come up when you're teaching? Yeah, probably the biggest thing is that people tend to focus on behavioral prescriptions uh, almost exclusively. And I think that's a byproduct of uh, a lack of understanding in the leadership genre in general. Uh, we tend to think that people respond primarily to what we're going to do as a leader. Um, and most of the courses that you see are designed around this idea of offering you know, behavioral solutions to people problems. And, you know, the truth is, um, I've found that foundationally, uh, the most effective thing leaders can focus on is not what they're doing, but how they're showing up with people in what they're doing. And that's something that often isn't talked about in the leadership space. We put a lot of emphasis on it with Arbinger. Uh, we talk about this idea that people don't respond primarily to what you're doing. They respond primarily to how they're feeling seen by you and what you're doing. And if what you're after in leadership is productive influence, then being authentic with people and showing up with them in a way that helps them feel seen, heard, understood, valued, and appreciated is probably the, the most essential characteristic of, a, again, of an effective leader. So. Yeah, that's interesting. There's obviously a lot of the conversations I've had this week have centered around like trying to shift away from like qualifications and the check in the box type training. I feel like this is the leadership is the same thing. You have leaders that like, hey, I want to have one to ones with all my officers. Hey, come into my office. Let's have a talk. Hey, next officer, come into my office. Let's have a, yeah. and they, it's kind of more of a check in the box. Like, hey, I'm checking in on you. Yeah. How are you doing? But like you had said, there's, it's, it's very superficial at that level. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah each person's different. I mean, uh, you know, people, we all boil at different degrees as Emerson said. And so, you know, one of the most impactful things a leader can do is really get to know their people and build relationships with them. And I'm talking about the kind of relationships that are professional, but more paternal in, 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 in a sense, meaning that, that they love their people. You can't love what you can't lead what you don't love. That's a principle of leadership. Um, but they love them in a more of a paternal way. It's not like we're, you know, buddy, buddy out drinking together all the time and, and, and causing that type of uh, breakdown and discipline. But, but it's a real concern for the individual person. And a team is comprised of individuals. And so when a leader realizes that, you build strong relationships with each of your team members. And, and they all need something a little bit different. You know, for you, for instance, uh, um, you're going to need at some point uh, at a basic level need to express gratitude for your hard work. But the way that I show up in that expression might be different for you. It might be a, a wink or a thumbs up or, you know, a punch in the arm. For another person, it might be a handwritten note or an email. For another person, it might be an actual official award. So, you know, you've got to get to know your people on an individual level so you know how best to approach them. I love that. that I mean, I think a lot of people can take that away and be like, oh, maybe there's, there's something I need to do for each individual person because everybody, like you said, responds to things differently. I do have a question for you that just popped into my head. For young leaders, for new leaders, maybe ones that got promoted up through the ranks, and now you go from having your peers to now being in a, a position of leadership. What are, those, what are the things that you want to take that new young leader aside and what are those things that you want to instill in them and just be like, hey, listen, there's going to be some pitfalls here. Let's try to work through that. Yeah, well, the very first thing that I tell young leaders to do is to be transparent and talk out loud about their concerns and anxieties. So if I've been shoulder to shoulder with you working on the same team and now I'm thrust into a leadership position where you report to me, um, I need to just talk and have a meeting and a discussion with the team about how awkward that is. Say, look, I, I'm going to be upfront about this. Um, you know, I'm... I feel a little bit awkward about the situation. It's going to take some adjustment. You know, we were peers yesterday. Today, I'm the supervisor. 
Um, what I want you to understand is when we were peers and we worked together, um, I worked really, really hard to be a good teammate. And I wanted to perfect my craft to the extent that I could. Um, that's no different here. Now I have a whole different set of responsibilities. I'm going to work really, really hard to also be very good at this. And it's going to look a little bit different sometimes. It might cause some tension sometimes. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm just trying to be the leader you deserve. And you just get out in front of it and have that conversation because it is awkward. Uh, you know, and trying to deny it is, is what, what happens when you try to deny it is I think you, you, you tend as a young leader to try to adopt a different personality. You know, people are always saying, well, well, gosh, that person, they changed. And, well, the truth is, yeah, if you don't change your perspective when you're promoted, you did something wrong. You have a whole different set of responsibilities and obligations. But at your, the core essential you, the things that really matter about you and your character, that's not changing. So just be honest and straightforward with your team about it. That's the best advice I can give a young leader. I love that. You know, I had a really interesting conversation. A buddy of mine's out of Toronto as uh, a team leader on one of the teams up there. Um, and we had this very long, in-depth discussion about that, the dynamic, right, between going from being on the team to leading a team and the, the reversal in roles where you're used to being maybe the first guy in that stack. Now you have to be active in, in understanding that I have to maybe take a step back from this and now let let everybody else, let my team do what they're good at and then fill that that supervisory role a little bit differently. And I find that that's usually a really hard thing to do for some people. Super hard. Uh, new leaders can get insecure. They won't have their hands in everything. Uh, they'll, they'll want to tend to micromanage because, again, their name's on it. Uh, whatever happens, you know, they're ultimately responsible. So it's really tempting to do that. And the other thing is, look, you're a new leader positionally, but if you've had aspirations to lead, it shouldn't be the first time you've been leading, right? right? You've been working into this, even as you're in your role as a teammate. You've been working into inserting yourself into to leadership uh, you know, situations and, and, and making your voice heard and asking questions. And so oftentimes what you find is a really effective young leader has already been leading you know, kind of non-positionally in such a way that people are almost like, oh yeah, Adam, well, yeah, of course he was gonna end up being the boss, right? Of course he was gonna end up being promoted. He's always been one that stepped up and, and taken responsibility. Quick question, because this is this is something else that we've seen happen. You have those leaders that you know that are just they're born leaders. You knew from the day one they got into the to the agency. You're like, that, this guy's going to be. We know he's going to be here somewhere. But you also have those promotions where people get put into leadership positions where everybody goes, oh shit. <laughs> what do you? How do you? How do you? What do you say to? officers that now maybe have a leader that is maybe not the person that they wanted. Yeah, well, you got to lead up. I mean, you know, again, we're all leaders, whether positional or not. So if I'm the kind of leader that comes in, I'm not really qualified. Maybe it was a, a political type promotion. Maybe I'm really liked, but I'm not totally technically competent. So I get a job. Um, your job then is to, if you see that weakness in me, build the relationship with me, build trust with me, do everything that you can so that you gain influence and then lead up. Help me become more competent. Help me become, you know, make it so that I trust you and you can give me that feedback and you can grow me. So instead of us huddling around in the locker room and tearing somebody down, let's criticize them to lift them up and empower them. You know, this is the leader we're going to have. Let's make them the best leader that we can possibly have. That's the idea, right? It's our responsibility. We don't abdicate our responsibility uh, to the team just because we got a leader that we didn't like. We don't reshuffle the deck or just sit back and, and hold back our best effort because we're not happy with the way things turned out. There's things you control, there's things you don't. We focus absolutely on the things we control. We can't control the leaders delegated to us sometimes. We can absolutely control how we show up for that leader and what we can do to make that leader the best possible leader they can be. Yeah, I love that. It, for me, that really strikes a chord because with my time with the military, as a young officer, you're, you come into a new platoon, you're probably one of the youngest people there, and now you have, you're tasked with leading a platoon of people. The platoon warrant runs the platoon. It isn't, it isn't the junior lieutenant, right? And what they do is their job, essentially, they coach and mentor that new officer on how to be a leader. Like, it's, it's the craziest thing. And, but that's instilled in the military stuff. In law enforcement, sometimes we see that where there's a weird thing where you have somebody who rises really, really, really quickly. Yeah. But usually, it's, it's based off of time and experience. So we don't maybe see those drastic changes as much. Yeah, well, I mean, like my, my philosophy has always been, you know, is, is commanders, officers command, and NCOs, non-commissioned officers, are those frontline law enforcement, the frontline sergeants, they lead. 
So what I, what I do as a commander is I empower my first line supervisors to be able to lead. And I step back and take that strategic view of the situation. I think about resourcing that I can provide them to help support them, training that they need, how can I equip them better, um, what kind of support and advocacy do they need so they can get their jobs done. The hardest part, I think, for a lot of people that promote to command is being removed from that work a little bit. It's so tempting to jump back down into that tactical level and get in everybody's way. But you're right. At the end of the day, it works in the military as it does in policing. We've got to let the first line supervisors, the corporals, the sergeants, we've got to let them lead. And ultimately, it benefits the organization because that's, that's the pipeline for your next commanders, right? Mm -hmm. You're growing these people, the capacity of these people. So again, the Sometimes you keep your hands in your pockets and stay off the radio. I love that, <laughs> right? I love that. Yeah. What is it that you want these instructors walking out of your class with? Like if, if, you're, if your hope is like, hey, come to my class and walk away with one, one thing or a couple things, what is that? Yeah, gosh, my biggest passion, uh, honestly, is just, again, the work I'm doing with Arbinger. I, I started full time with them now since I retired in December. I just want them to understand that we have a tendency to objectify other people. We have a tendency... Uh, it's innate to see people only in terms of how they can hurt us or help us. Uh, and, and because of that, we tend to manipulate them or avoid them. And it's one of the biggest pitfalls of leadership. We have got to see people as people. We can't see them as a means to an end. We must see them as an end in and of themselves. And that is incredibly important. If you're looking for productive influence, people have to feel that from you. They have to feel. That's what we mean when we say authenticity. They have to feel that, right, that real connection. So supervisors end up being able to connect more and correct less. People self-correct. Um, our job, and this is a big thing I try to get them to take away, our job as leaders are not to, is not to hold people accountable, it's to help prepare, equip, and train them to be accountable. If I look around at my team and I've got a bunch of people that, aren't, that, that, that I have to hold accountable, that means one thing, that means they, they're not accountable. And it's my job to help them be accountable. Um, and probably the last thing is just pay attention for our tendency to to justify the things that we do are crooked, that are crooked, right? When I have a sense that I should help a teammate and I make a commitment to meet them after work, let's say to mentor them, and then I blow them off to go, you know, play darts with my buddies, what I'll tend to do is I'll justify that crooked behavior in my mind to the point that I think it's straight, you know? I've, I, I've, I've betrayed myself and my sense of what was right for this person, but then I justify it with all these excuses in my mind so fast that that wrong seems right. And the irony is, because of my power to justify, uh, what other people might call biases, I might call justifications, because of my power to do that, I'll feel like I'm right in my most wrong moments. And so I'm walking around thinking I'm doing the best I can do in the situation, and then I'll tend to blame it back on you as the person I'm supposed to be serving. And then we get into this collusion and it just tanks everything. We waste so much time with that. So those are the things I ask uh, that I hope in the short time I'm with my, uh, uh, my, my fellow instructors when I'm facilitating, I hope they take away what I hope they take away from the conversation. That's phenomenal. Last year, you were the instructor of the year. What? <laughs> Came back this year. You keep coming back, Twilita. What keeps bringing you back? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I said this last year, and I, I don't want to keep beating the horse, but really, it's 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 the camaraderie. It's just look, you've got a bunch of the best, world's best trainers in the same spot. You can you can sample different courses. You can talk to different people offline. You can socialize and just get to know folks better and build relationships. And what I find is a very small part of my consultancy is still working in the defense space when police officers are sued. Uh, I think I'm carrying two cases now on uh, deadly force incidents. Um, I can call people up. I know people from all around the world that I can call them and say, hey, I ran into something I'm not really equipped to deal with. Is it something you can help on, right? Hey, I ran into a less lethal munitions issue um, during a protest. It's really not my area of expertise. Um, you know, would you be willing to consult with this, this attorney or this team of attorneys? I love having that network of people, right? So we have this common thing, and this thing we have in common is I lead it, and it pulls us together and joins us together, and it just, the relationships are, are indispensable. Well, brother, I appreciate you taking the time, joining me again. You bet, man. Hey, it's always great to, to chat, so I'm glad we hooked up. We'll see you back next year. All right, take care. Awesome.